Let's talk about particles in Godot 4. Hi, I'm Mike, and today I wanted to talk to you about particles in Godot 4. Um, this video took me quite a while to put together just because there's a lot to cover and I wasn't really sure what direction I wanted to go with this. Um, the direction that I've ultimately settled on is today in this video we're going to just go over kind of a basic overview of the particle system in Godot 4, um, specifically the 3D particle system. And I'm just going to show you examples of what each of these different options does visually. Um, I know there's documentation online and there's uh, it's relatively complete. So you'll be able to read about this if you would like. Um, and I'll leave a link to the documentation in the description below. But for me, I always find it easier to have a visual reference for these things. Um, I find that's the way that I learn. Um, and I figure that's probably going to be useful for a bunch of you out there. And then in future uh, videos about particles. I will give you more specific recipes for more particular effects or more particular things that you might be looking to do. So here we are in Godot. Let's get started by adding a GPU particle 3D to the scene. And you'll notice we have a warning here. It's telling us that we're missing both the instructions for what to do with the particles and how to draw the particles. So let's solve the drawing first and we'll add a triangle mesh so you can see which direction or which Y direction is up. And then let's add a process material, which is basically the instructions for what to do with each of the particles that you're drawing. You'll see as soon as we started that, we have it falling down um, because the way it's set up, the default is to have some gravity applied to it. Now, if we go back to the GPU particle itself, we can set a number for how many instances of the particle we want to have drawn at any particular time. And if we increase it to 20, you can see that they spawn a lot more densely. But now if we come down here and adjust the time, which is how long each of the particles lasts on screen before it is um, removed and then started again. And you'll see just how much distance is between them all. So the next thing we want to do is showing the one time toggle. If we turn that on, that means it'll generate all of these, the number of particles once, and then it'll be done and it'll turn off. And then the pre-processing, if we want to turn that up to one second, it'll render things as though a one second has already passed in the generator. And so you'll see they just kind of appear and then fall down. Uh, up next is the explosiveness, which is how many of them appear all at the same time. If we turn it up all the way, that means that they all show up at the same time. But if we reduce it just a little bit, you'll see that they all appear close together as opposed to evenly spaced apart. Uh, and then the randomness is something we can just play with to essentially just how much variation there is in between uh, particles being generated. Now, coming to the process material for the instructions, we can give a randomness for how long each of the particles lasts. So it's a random effect on the lifetime of the particle. Up next, we have the emission shape, and that's defining or where the initial position of each of the particles is generated. If we start with a point, they will all be uh, showing up in the same position. But if we change it to a sphere, they will all start to show up uh, within the confines of a sphere that is a radius of one. Uh, to better see this, um, I'm just going to go down and change the gravity to zero so it doesn't keep falling down. And I'll just demonstrate here that if you change the gravity to be a positive number, they'll start to fly upwards. Um, as though they're getting carried away or blown away. Going back to setting it to zero so they just kind of appear and disappear. Let's go back to change the shape. But we can change it to a sphere surface, which means that they'll only appear on the surface of that sphere and not in the middle of it. Uh, let me increase the radius to make this easier to see. Um, other options we have are box, so you can change change the emission shape to within a box, the dimensions of which you can control here. And then there are a couple of others that I haven't quite figured out how to use yet. Um, they appear to require textures. Unfortunately, I don't have a good idea of what they would be most useful for. Uh, with the exception of the torus here, you can set it as a, a donut shape, basically. So if you want to have a hole in the middle of something, this is a emission shape you can set. Uh, 
All right, going down here now, we can set the initial velocity. So instead of just kind of appearing there, they can be moving in a certain direction. So we'll set the minimum and maximum. Uh, and you can see that they appear to be going along the x-axis. And if we go back up a little bit to the direction, this is where we can play around with that. You can see that the direction is pointed in the x-axis and there's a spread of 45 degrees, which means that there's a deflection along of 45 degrees around the x-axis to give it some more randomness and variation. We can increase the flatness so it'll limit it to just deflecting across the uh, x, z plane. Next up, we have angular velocity, which you'll see if I add some numbers here, doesn't appear to do anything. Now, we can set some particle flags here. So if we set the align y value, you can see that now the y direction is aligned to the direction in which the particle is traveling. And if we set the rotate y value, um, you can see that they all now return to their original thing, but we can now play with their angular velocity. So if we turn that up, we can see that as they are flying out, they are spinning around their y-axis. Now, if you want it to spin around a different axis, you can set the disable z value, uh, and this will do two effects. One, it will basically flatten the emission of the particles along the xy plane. They won't go in the z direction at all, but it also means that you can spin around the z direction. So depending on the effect that you want, these are the different flags that you want to select. If we look at linear acceleration, um, that's basically in the direction that it, the particle is traveling, it will start to accelerate and travel faster in that direction. The radial acceleration now is similar to linear acceleration, but it's the direction in which it accelerates is based off of where it is in relation to the origin. Because I have the emission shape set to a point, they will all continue to work the same way as uh, linear velocity. But if I change the emission shape to a box, you can see now that they're all starting to accelerate away from the origin based on where they spawn within the box. You can definitely use this for something that explodes and you want to move away from the center. Uh, just turn off the initial velocity um, so that way you don't get them turning around. Okay, so up next we have tangential velocity, or acceleration, sorry, which just basically means that how much does it accelerate going around in a tangent to the direction that it originally traveled. Um, so in this case, it basically just forces them all to travel around in a, a spiral away from the origin. Up next is damping, which is basically friction in the air. So how much they slow down as they're traveling. You can offset this a little bit with acceleration if you want to simulate them traveling through different fluids or different substances, or you can just have it turn up and they just kind of stop at certain points Next up is the angle, and again, this is one that doesn't really have any effect unless you have the correct particle flags set. So again, align Y doesn't work, but setting the rotate Y or the um, disable Z will have them appearing at certain angles. And you can compare that with angular velocity and you can start them at different angles and they will spin as well. Again, without the right particle flags, it doesn't really do anything. So scale is basically just how big the object is when it starts. And in this one and some of the others, you can set um, a curve, which affects the value based on how long the particle has existed. So if we set this here, um, start with kind of a small scale, ramps up closer to one, and then shrinks back down to a smaller item, you can see that it looks like they are starting small, getting bigger and then disappearing over time. If we set the particle color, at the moment you'll see it doesn't really do anything. And that's because of the way the material is set in the draw pass. So 
So if we go in and we give a new 3D material here, what we want to do in order to be able to change it with that setting is we need to come down into the vertex color and select um, use as albedo. And there we go. We now have control over the color. And what we can do with this is we can now set some variations in hue to give it some randomness and some interesting and some interest there. And we can set a value to change over time if we want. Now we can just add some noise to the system. And this is a great way to simulate things like smoke coming up through the air or like air currents moving around blowing things out of the way. At this point, I, there's another way to get the rotations to have an effect, and that is to have the material set as a, um, a particle billboard. So as an example, I'm just going to add another draw pass, and then we'll set this to be just a quad mesh. We'll uh, set it to a particle billboard. And now when we come back up to set the angle, we can start to see how it affects particle billboard effect or part of the particle uh, and not the triangle part of the particle. Now, before I finish off this video, there's one more thing that I want to demonstrate. And that is we can set a particle collision uh, box to interact with the the particles that are being generated here. We have to enable it and if we set to, to rigid we can see that it just it stops at the bounds of the box and will continue to move um, based on the properties that we set. So we can set them to have a bounce. We can set them to have some friction so that uh, they will slow down as they go. The other thing that we can do is when it hits the collision is we can just disable it. We can turn it off so that the original particle disappears. We can add a subparticle as well. So if we create a new GPU 3D, and in this case, I'm just going to use a torus so you can clearly see what's going on. We can set it to be the subparticle of the original particle that we were working on, and then we can set it to emit on collision. Now we have to make sure that we disable or set the original particle to disable on collision, otherwise it will keep colliding as it moves along the surface, which is not the effect that I'm going for here, but it is certainly something that you might want to play around with yourself. Um, and then I guess the final thing that I haven't covered yet is its particle trails, which we're just going to switch the sub particle to be instead of a bunch of toruses that are being emitted, we're going to change it to some particle trails. And then we can go down into the material itself and select use as particle trail uh, and then enable the under transform, enable the particle trail. And then we go back up to the particle itself, um, enable the trails. Oh, and don't forget to disable the back face culling of the particles. And then you have 
something that you can play around with, and that's how you can get some trails. Now, you will note here that nothing looks particularly impressive with these particles, and a large part of that is because there are no textures on any of these particles. And from what I've been experiencing, there's particles are only really as good as the textures that you apply to them. So that's something that we'll have to cover in the next installment for specific recipes for how to get particular particle effects in your games. Oh, and uh, last thing that I forgot to show off earlier, here under drawing, you can set it to local coordinates. And if you do that, if I rotate this, you can see that it's following all of the rules properly for the local rotation system or the local coordinate system of the particle emitter. But if we turn it off, it acts more like we would expect to see in the real world, I guess. So it wouldn't, it follows the world space as opposed to the local coordinate space. And there we have it. That was a quick overview of most of the different options that are available to you with the particle system. There are a couple of things that I didn't touch on, mostly because I didn't really have a chance to play around with them and or understand how they work, like the uh, animations for the particles. Um, I haven't had a chance to uh, really learn that yet, so um, that will probably be coming in a, another video in the future. So if you found the video helpful, uh, hitting the like button is a great way to let me know that and to help get the video to a wider audience. Um, YouTube thinks that you'll like this video over here. And that's it for me for now. So take care of yourselves and good luck with your projects. I'll see you next time.